So, welcome back. So, in the previous lecture, which was of module 1, we discussed the usually the processes. So, what scale different process takes place and we talked about uh, the setup reconstituting of a reactor and a distillation column and how they will be arranged, all this we discussed. Now, in today's lecture, what we will do is we take it forward and we see what is the structure of our chemical industry. So, when we talk about the structure of chemical industry, it may be either uh, our own in India or worldwide. So, we will take both these cases together and see what are the other uh, sources of energy. Primarily, most of the part of this particular course is devoted to the sources of energy, whether it is crude oil, whether it is biomass, whether it is natural gas. So, we will see one by one. So, properties or chemicals which are derived from this will devote mostly in module 3 and module 4. Okay. So, today's lecture we start with the in the within module 1, we are in the module 1 and the structure 2 which is structure of chemical industry. So, we discussed initially the introduction to the chemical industry as a general like uh, what are the different base chemicals, uh, base chemicals we discussed briefly in the previous lecture, I will discuss it in detail. Then energy production, the energy production implies that uh, what are the different sources of energy where you are getting, they, because one of there may be sustainable, sustainable I implying it means maybe from solar energy or it may be from you know the biomass energy. Uh, in this part, we are not considering the nuclear energy because nuclear energy is something which is not will be taken up in this particular uh, course, but that is also a you can I mean you can call it as a sustainable energy because energy from the nuclear lasts for a lifetime. I mean it is uh, very in that way it is sustainable, but sustainable in this true sense is solar. So, solar energy is something that amount of radiation which reaches the earth and uh, how much of it we are able to utilize. When we talk about how much we are able to utilize, we talk about uh, you know, those uh, reactions in geochemistry we call it geology. In the previous lecture I have told now there are several reactions that suppose the formation of oil and the formation of coal where the rate of the reaction is very slow. So, it is forms at different temperature and high pressure and other reactions may be photosynthesis is one of the reactions. So, what it, what it does is the plants take up this solar energy and do photosynthesis. So, it is a using this energy, but that is only a fraction. So, we are using a fraction of that energy of the solar. So, maybe uh, that is also another huge uh, open ended problem. So, how to utilize the solar energy. So, nowadays we have several avenues for utilizing this renewable form of energy. So, we will also discuss those briefly. Then biomass is one of the renewable source of energy because biomass can be from different uh, origin. You know, biomass can be from our municipal waste or household waste or it may be agricultural stubble or it may be decaying crops, anything. These all are clubbed as biomass. In fact, nowadays uh, people are also working in the what we call 3G fuel. It is called from microalgae. So, from microalgae also we are getting its form of biomass, we are doing, people are doing experiments. So, all this comes under biomass. Then we discuss about the production of the base chemicals. So, what are the base chemicals? Base chemicals, uh, you know, we will be discussing two uh, domains of base chemicals. One is inorganic base chemical, that is uh, where one of the example I can give is sulfuric acid. Then we can talk about organic like organic we are very much we know that the organic means we are dealing with crude oil or uh, natural gas or sometimes syn gas all these comes under organic. Likewise, we will discuss this. So, in the inorganic chemicals the chemical industry if I want to discuss this chemical industry it is in basically classified into three types the inorganic chemicals, the organic chemicals and the crude oil. Okay. So, inorganic chemicals are uh, primarily of two types sulfuric acid and sodium bicarbonate because sulfuric acid you will be required uh, because it can be used as a catalyst in the production of several other chemicals. So, it will be used for that purpose. So, there are base chemicals, then there are intermediate chemicals, then there are specialty chemicals. So, there are three stages of chemicals which has been product, uh, used in production. So, base chemicals from there you convert something to intermediate and from intermediate chemicals to specialized chemicals. 
For example, if unorganic chemicals consist of sulfuric acid and sodium bicarbonate, then organic chemicals are like, uh, you know, these are since initially, this is the initial part when the discovery of the chemical industry were performed, let's say 100 years back. Then they started with the formulation of synthetic dye. So the ones of the synthetic dye uh, is uh, aniline uh, based compound that is aniline movin A. So you must be knowing of the famous chemist Perkin. So he attempted to synthesize this particular chemical because they were in great demand. And from there the demand for the aromatics increased. The aromatics are usually classified in benzene, toluene, xylene, BTX we call it. So these benzene, toluene, xylene you can uh, use it for production of further specialty chemicals. So these are that's why in great demand. They can be obtained from coal, primarily from coal or from crude oil. Then crude oil, then came in the chemical industry uh, the focus on crude oil because we have gasoline. Now gasoline is loosely specific it is something that are either diesel or petrol. So the demand for this increases because as the per capita consumption increased of energy, so people uh, now relied on the energy sources. So energy sources implying either coal or fossil fuels such as oil. So there are other fossil fuels also nowadays which is you must be well aware of that is natural gas which is primarily methane. Then uh, you will also have based on natural gas several variants that is called uh, synthetic natural gas, that is liquefied natural gas, then compressed natural gas. So all these are variants of this natural gas. It is only the to like liquefied natural gas, LNG, they are very easy to transport. That is why they are transported in liquid form. So then an important part then again the interest rose that okay uh, fine we are with many chemicals, we are manufacturing inorganic, organic chemicals and crude oil derivatives. But what about the sustainability? So how many years will it last? So will it last for a lifetime? If not, then what are the other alternate sources? Then people started looking at alternative sources. Alternative sources such as solar energy, then you have the wind energy, then you have the energy from biomass. But uh, even though a lot of progress has been made in this field, but still people are relying on, you know, the, still the fossil fuels, even though progress has been made in the field of uh, other alternative fuel. So if I write down uh, the total chemical structure, it means it is uh, like the base chemicals. So base of bulk chemicals means these bulk chemicals, some of the bulk chemicals are actually most of the bulk materials are made from 10 raw materials. Mostly all the bulk chemicals are made from 10 raw materials, whether it is inorganic or organic. In inorganic, what are the raw materials? Air, water and minerals. And organic, what are the raw materials? Oil, coal, natural gas and biomass also nowadays. Okay. So they are made by these raw 10 raw materials. From these 10 raw materials, we made close to 300 intermediates. So around 300 intermediates results from these 10 raw materials. So what are these intermediates? These intermediates may be, you know, this uh, some compounds, let us say you are uh, preparing acetic acid as one of the intermediate and from acetic acid you do something else and form a useful product. So like that, there are many such intermediate. Sometimes the intermediate itself is a product. Let us say if I want to convert it from the crude oil, we are converting it into ethene and propene. C2 and C3. So these are all uh, the actually the product because with this actually you make this polymer, polymer like uh, polyethylene, polypropylene, all these. So these are also itself their product. The intermediate com chemicals may itself become a desired product. So some specialty chemicals are also made such as industrial specialty chemicals like paints, varnishes, then the consumer chemicals like detergents, uh, again varnishes and then maybe uh, some household chemicals. But oil as a raw material uh, we know when we are talking of oil as a raw material it can be into different products it can form. It can form lower alkene just now I discussed which is a raw material for uh, you know this petrochemical. These are all raw materials for petrochemicals. Ethene, propene, butene we call it C2, C3, C4. C2 means 2 carbon atom, C3, 3 carbon atom, butadiene means 4 carbon. So you can make either polyethylene and polyethylene also two variants, high density polyethylene, low density polyethylene like that, propene, butadiene. Then this is another important um, you know, aromatics, the BTX, the benzene, toluene, xylene. 
this is the production of aromatics. Then syngas, now syngas can be made from uh, oil as well as from coal. So usually they consist mainly hydrogen and carbon monoxide. Now this hydrogen and carbon monoxide can be of very use because this carbon monoxide and hydrogen, you can use hydrogen in the case of let us say you want to form ammonia. So hydrogen will be used up there or you want to do hydroprocessing reaction, you can use this hydrogen again for hydroprocessing reaction means where you convert them into straight chain compounds. Okay. So those hydrogen processing reactions or maybe in the production of methanol. So even carbon monoxide and hydrogen can be together, we can combine them and form methanol which is again one of the product from syngas, synthesis gas. Okay. Ammonia, ammonia production, likewise you can also uh, give what we called as the fischer tropsch reaction, the fischer tropsch reaction also produce the fischer tropsch products. So these are very important, this oil as raw material. But if current uh, particular course, we won't focus much on oil because we will be focusing on the industrial specialty chemicals because we want to produce on something which is of value. Okay. So let us suppose you make uh, 100 tons of a particular chemical and uh, 1 ton of some specialty chemicals, the amount of value let us say of 1 ton is higher than 100 ton. So probably because of the economics, uh, you may be preparing this specialty chemicals because their usage is much more defined or it is much more in demand. So that is why industries or refineries, they are focusing on the production of these specialty chemicals. So for example, these lower alkenes, one it can be further produced from the steam cracking of ethane because crude oil will not give directly ethane, crude oil will give you ethane or naphtha. Naphtha also of three stages, it may be of middle naphtha, then uh, heavy naphtha, light naphtha. So from that naphtha, if you pass steam, it will be converted to alkenes or aromatics where you catalytic reforming process, it is well known, I will not discuss the catalytic reforming process. So it means you are reforming the, you know, the compounds which are aliphatics to aromatics, it is called catalytic reforming. Then synthesis gas is one of the product from crude oil, it is the feedstock for ammonia and methanol. It can also be obtained from the steam reforming of natural gas. So the roots, there are different roots for the production of synthesis gas, one is you can from getting from crude oil or from natural gas. So crude oil and natural gas both are, what are these, these are base chemical. Then what the next step may be in sometimes what you happen is that in these compounds you may add some heteroatom, let us say when you add heteroatom you may form acetic acid, formaldehyde, ethene oxide, monomers, okay. Ethene oxide is of huge use because ethene oxide it helps us to get a epoxy ring, okay. Epoxy ring helps us to add the oxygen atom. So in that way in many various reactions you actually, we will be using this ethene oxide to convert them into or uh, add up any oxygen atom. Then uh, when we define our specialty chemicals means we are defining those chemicals which are of high value, let us say which are used in plastic industry like PVC, polyacrylonitrile, like polyacrylonitrile is a useful polymer which is used in the filter. So suppose you want to purify water, this pan uh, membranes can be used to purify water because it works well to separate out the viruses, bacteria and other heavy metals. Then synthetic fibers, you have this polyethylene, telephthalate, then nylon 6, then elastomers, paints, coatings, agrochemicals, fertilizers, then specialty chemicals may be categorized, categorized as vitamins, flavors, fragrances, then soaps, detergents, cosmetics and pharmaceuticals. So these are all high valued products, you call value added products. So these are very useful from the chemical engineering perspective. So for every stage complexity of the molecules become larger and the added value of the chemicals become higher. Okay. So ethene based chemical formed from hydrocarbon present in oil is a monomer for the direct formation of plastics. So ethene means you are talking about polyethylene. So from ethene you can manufacture polyethylene. So that is why it is a raw material in the petrochemical industry. Chemical can be classified as an intermediate as a consumer product. So summarizing we can also classify it as an intermediate or a consumer product. For example, sulphur is one of the raw material. So where do we get sulphur, where it is used? It most of them is used in the manufacture of sulphuric acid which is again a base chemical and uh, rest in fertilizers. 
So it may be the source may be byproduct of natural gas or oil refining or production here outshines the demand due to stricter environmental legislation. Because sometimes the production of it, suppose elemental sulphur you are getting, the production of it outshines the demand because you have this environmental legislation because you cannot have the effluent socks into the atmosphere. So you have some legislation that how many parts per million or parts per volume should be there. So maybe nowadays with elemental sulphur if you are not using in these some new applicants have come up like it may be used to make sulphur concrete or sulphur enhanced asphalt modifier. So these two are the new uses for these sulphur compounds. So now let us see these fossil fuel reserves. The fossil fuel reserves are the coal, gas and oil. So what is this coal? We know much we mean is knowing. So what we have in the y axis are the different fossil fuels coal, gas, oil and the x axis represents the reserves to production ratio. It means that uh, this particular uh, graph implies that what is the current yearly production okay, and how many reserves are there. So you divide these two values, it will give how many years it will last. So it seems that oil is around 50 years, gas when I talk of gas, it is natural gas 60 years, coal is 120 years. So these are just average estimate ratio. So we need to, you know, we need to find out some new alternative sources because uh, we have uh, something which is reserves to product ratio not lasting more than 100 or 120 years. So what are the sources? One of the sources is right now research is going on is shale gas. For shale gas, you know, must be knowing that there are uh, two uh, PSU giants in our country that is uh, Gas Authority of India Limited, Gale and then we have this ONGC, they are using and they are doing, uh, are directing the research into the shale gas which has not been explored so far. This is shale gas is also a type of natural gas. Whenever I talk about natural gas, it implies primarily methane which is trapped in a non-porous rock that is tightly binded to the gas. So the gas is tightly binded to the rock. So what they will do is uh, they will pass some chemical along with water so that the binding between the gas and the rock comes out and uh, you get the shale gas out along with the particular uh, chemical you actually inject it into the well. It is something like the similarly like a oil well, similarly like we have a reservoir for shale gas. Now I was telling about the comparison of energy production. So how much of energy is required, okay. So this energy required means and what is this? This is the radiation and photosynthesis. Now energy required at 2050, I mean these are all approximate values. It's taken from this book, this is natural gas, this is oil, this is coal and this is biomass. So currently, currently these values in the y axis, these are the sources of energy and the value at the top of the y axis which is the energy required in year 2050 and in the x axis how much we are consuming, this is exajoules per annum, exajoules per annum, okay. What is this exajoules per annum means? Uh, it means how much of energy is liberated how much of energy is liberated per annum worldwide and what is this TW terawatt? So what is the power, it is conversion of into power, how much of power is liberated? So these two radiation and photosynthesis, these are from the sun. So this is not to be confused with this graph. So the sun's rays around 1,25,000 terawatt per year strikes the earth which corresponds to roughly 4 to the into 10 to the power of 6 exajoules per annum. Now see this, this is very interesting, plants use only a fraction, if I want to say it is only 0.1 percent, plants are able to use only 0.1 percent of the total photons which are striking the earth. So it is only 130 terawatt, only 0.1 percent or translates to 4000 exajoules per annum. So it means that biomass is a valuable source of energy, so it can trap this energy. 
So, if I, we can think of this alternative sources of energy, it will be very useful, but the only issue is we should not be competing with the edible seeds. Okay. The land should be used in such a manner that it can be only used for non-edible, so it should not compete with our uh, food crops, okay. that should be very important. Now natural goose gas consumption in terms of exajoules is around 100 and you can say 120, oil is around uh, it is more, it is around 170, coal is around 140, like that biomass is only 50. So here we have tremendous, here we have tremendous scope. Tremendous scope is there in the case of biomass. So, if you see the blue ones represent the corresponding terawatt, okay. but the energy required in 2050 is around if we go by this rate, it is close to 350. So, the total energy if you add this, it is almost 3 times of the total amount of energy you require. So, we have to think of alternative sources of energy. So, we were discussing the alternative source of energy. What is that alternative source of energy? It is one of the one is biomass. So, what is the use of lignocellulose biomass? When I mean the term lignocellulose, it means the biomass has two components from this word implying lignin and cellulose. So, act, by definition, truly speaking, it has three components. One is lignin, cellulose and hemicellulose. But Cellulose and hemicellulose are interchangeably described because cellulose is the crystalline form, hemicellulose is the amorphous form. So, the use is fossil fuels are commonly used to produce the energy we need, but they are harmful to the environment and one day we will run out of these non-renewable sources. Just now we have discussed. The fossil fuels are central to life, even though it is central to life in the modern society, but there are some problems that it is limited. We just now saw the supply is limited and the use of this have environmental issues. We may be using it, but the environmental is issues concerning particulate matter, then the SOX, NOx. Now burning fossil fuels contribute to pollution, thus contributing the greenhouse effect, carbon dioxide increment and acid rain. Okay. So lignocellulic biomass is one of the alternative energy source for the production of value added chemicals. So what is cellulose? It consists of three components, the cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin. We will see one by them together. So, any biomass has these three products, cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin. So, it means if we are going to separate these, it has to be undergoing some pretreatment. Suppose you have some plant, you can crush it, then you have to separate out this because this is crystalline nature, this is crystalline, this is amorphous. While this is a polymer which is strongly binded to the plant wall. So, what are the different biomass treatment method? What happens in all this treatment method? What happens is it will dissolve this amorphous nature, this amorphous part, it will separate out these two parts from cellulose. Cellulose is crystalline, it will not dissolve. So, these are the different methods. You can use dilute acid, you can hot water, steam explosion, supercritical water, subcritical water, ionic liquids, and alkali treatment. Okay. So, these now the treatments I have will be taught in later in later modules, we need to also do see the green effectiveness, green processes. So, these three you know as greens processes, supercritical water, subcritical water, ionic liquid. It means these three does not use any fossil fuel precursor, even though ionic liquid not much is known, many of them are made from fossil fuels, but subcritical water and supercritical water, we can uh, safely confirm that these are of green technology. So, it means what we have is, we have lignin overall, if I want to say what is the composition of biomass, we have the lignin 15 to 25 percent, hemicellulose 23.32 percent, cellulose and others which are extractive and ash in any biomass. So, it means the dissolution of lignocellulose just now I described in the previous slide. What happens? Now, see, uh, you see these are hemicellulose which are, you know, they are packed in random directions. These are lignin which are strongly bonded with the plant wall and the green ones which you see are the cellulose which are crystalline. So, these are crystalline nature, amorphous nature. When you do a pretreatment, they will break away. The cellulose sugars, here it is coming out. 
so you see the hemicellulose is coming out, the red ones are broken up. So the idea of doing a pretreatment for any biomass is to reduce the crystallinity of cellulose so that you make it ready for conversion to valuable chemicals. So you convert this cellulose to sugar and from this sugar you do a enzymatic process to convert it into useful chemicals such as alcohols and alcohols such as ethanol, butanol. So these are used as possible source of energy. So if you see the cellulose chain, you see both inter and intramolecular hydrogen bonds is possible. So you see this is where I have given a cellulose chain, okay. So n can be a very large number. So if you say uh, here you have the cellulose chain, now in this B you can see in this B part this particular, you can see you can have both inter and intramolecular. So you have this, uh, see this is the inter and here you have in, uh, so intramolecular, this is intermolecular. Because of this reason, it is highly crystalline in nature, okay. Now what is the structure of hemicellulose looks like? So this is the chemical structure of hemicellulose. I mean just, uh, just a rough structure, there can be many possible structures possible based on the source of the biomass. So it is again N is a very high number. Now you see the structure of hemicellulose, again it is a ring which is bit branched as compared to cellulose, it is not branched. So that is why because of its branched nature, they are amorphous. So they are easy to, you know, you know, separate out from cellulose. Then comes the lignin. So I am just drawing some monomers of lignin. It is very difficult to draw the entire structure of lignin. So these are fun of some of the monomers of lignin. Let us say this is comoryl, paracomoryl alcohol, this one. Then you have sinapyl alcohol coniferyl alcohol. So it is something like that the lignin they are uh, uh, you know this, this, this all are connected together to form a very complex polymeric substance. So they are very difficult to remove. So they, they actually will remain after you extract and remove cellulose and hemicellulose from the biomass. So you remember you have cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin any biomass. So what are the, there are some compounds which are known as monosaccharides. What are monosaccharides means you have one glycosidic ring. So what are those, these are, it may be this monosaccharide may be either, you know, it may be either this cellulose or hemicellulose. For example, galactose is hemicellulose, glucose is cellulose. So these are the chemical formula, molecular wet, the fusion temperature is the melting point for these and this is the heat of fusion. So these are some monosaccharide, we can also term it monosaccharide because of the single ring glycosidic ring. Disaccharides uh, like same thing, in disaccharides you can also have cellulose as well as hemicellulose. This is for, for example cellobiose, there are two rings together, maltose, manodrote, monohydrate, two rings, again in sucrose you have two rings. So these two rings, for example this is cellulose and these two um, maltose, these are if you see the molecular weight, melting point, then the heat of fusion and entropy of fusion is are reported. Now after you do pretreatment and separate out cellulose, what is the way, how does one operate? Let us say this is the basic flow diagram of a biorefinery. What you do in this particular process is, this is your feed, biomass feedstock. Uh, we use in this case, I have given the example of the green solvent which is ionic liquid. Here you can use several other solvents also, it is possible, you can use acid, you can use hot, supercritical um, uh, water, subcritical water. What happens is dissolution, cellulose will go up, hemicellulose, lignin, lignin will come down. So cellulose is separated out. Then what you do, this entire process, cellulose, you put an enzyme. This process is called enzymatic hydrolysis. This enzymatic hydrolysis converts this cellulose to fermentable sugars. From these sugars, what happens is you actually do a fermentation. If you do a fermentation on a sugar, it will get converted to alcohol. Or this is another route, let us say instead of this green solvent, you use dilute sulfuric acid. Uh, same process, again you reach enzymatic hydrolysis. So either you use a green solvent or you use a conventional acid. Ex effectively what you are doing is you are reducing the crystallinity 
of cellulose. Once you do that, reducing the crystallinity of the cellulose, you can easily do an enzyme process on it. So, you can convert them into fermentable sugar. So, this is one of the enzyme, the cellulose, cellulase enzyme. Uh, it is the particular manufacture of this and this is the Cas number for the cellulase enzyme. Now, frequently this energy and chemical industry are related to each other. Now, we have discussed about the, you know, we have discussed about the chemical, uh, the biomass. Now, let us see because we have frequently require a energy. So, energy means it is in the either in the form of primarily in the form of steam. So, for the production of steam, therefore, you know, this takes a major step in all the processes which we will be covering in the modules 2 and further on. So, you have a typical diagram for a steam generator. So, what happens is this is called uh, you know the steam drum. So, fuel and air are mixed, they are heated up and mixed, water is here. So, this actually vapor comes here, it goes through the riser tubes and drops down here. So, here steam and water is separated out. So, steam is then let out from this upper channel and uh, the remaining again comes down and it is again reheated like that. Some of them may be lost, some of the water may be lost in the steam, wet steam, if it is wet steam. So, you have to add up, make up water to it and the remaining flue gases then they are let up here. Now, what to do with flue gases? If you are using flue gases, what you do is you use them, again you can use, again you can convert it and put it here, this flue gases to so heat the steam. So, why I took this example was you can actually make it sustainable. You can use the flue gases coming out from the steam chamber either in itself or in a waste type heat boiler like that. So, because this steam is used a utility because the hot utility is used for many purposes. For example, steam uh, cracking you will be using is all these things to convert various products to ethene and propene where you require steam. So, steam generation is a heart of any process in a chemical industry. So, when we talk of the flow sheets which we will be discussing frequently, we are actually wherever in the flow sheet I would be mentioning either HP, MP or LP. HP means high pressure steam, MP means medium pressure and low pressure. So, the operating condition is something like high pressure is 40 bar and this temperature, saturation temperature is much. High pressure steam will not have any liquid, then medium pressure steam, then it is 10 bar or temperature of this much, saturation temperature low pressure is around 3 bar. So, more or less this is classified in industry as the uh, by definition HP, MP, LP refers to high pressure, medium pressure and low pressure steam. Now, we come back again to the question of composition of film. Now, we know the any energy source will have carbon and hydrogen primarily carbon and hydrogen atom, but we need to know what are these ratios of carbon and hydrogen because this is very important. So, we have to know what is the calorific value of the fuel. So, if you see it is the maximum for coal, then comes coal liquid, then come biomass, then shale oil, then residual oil, crude oil, fuel oil and the least for methane. So, methane will be least because it is uh, you know it is CH4. So, CH4 means uh, you have uh, 1 is to 4, so 0.25, it is something like that, it is 0 0.25. So, uh, carbon to hydrogen ratio. Likewise, so the, so it means see this amount of calorific value for coal is pretty high because it is actually, it is actually ranges. It is not from 0, but it primarily ranges between 3 to you can say these many ranges it actually 3 to 2 or sometimes 3 to 1.5 depending upon the source of the coal. Then coal liquid, so if I want to say these are the average values, biomass like that shale oil. So, we have a lot of tremendous potential in coal, but as again it is a fossil fuel, so we need to focus on those which are sustainable. So, base chemicals again I want to recollect, it has the lower alkenes, then aromatics, then methanol, lower alkenes are ethene, propene, butadiene, then aromatics like benzene, toluene, xylene, 
then syngas and sulfuric acid ammonia. So, this is to summarize what we did just now, the base chemicals, what are those base chemicals, lower alkenes, aromatics, methanol, syngas, sulfuric acid, okay. So, from raw materials you manufacture base chemicals, from base chemicals to intermediate chemicals and intermediate chemicals to consumer chemicals. So, what are the manner in which they are being produced worldwide, let us see. So, now this is the production of base chemicals in million tons per annum, this 2010 data. So, now overall you see the base chemicals, if you see uh, the gasoline diesel actually leads the, leads the way, then comes closely sulfuric acid ammonia. Now, so this production of the sulfuric acid and ammonia may be an useful indicator how the economy is performing, okay, how the economy of a particular country is performing, okay. Then you have light alkenes which are very useful as a petrochemical feedstock then benzene, toluene, zoline and then methanol. So, what we do, how, so for example, if the case of crude oil as a compound, we do some refinery operation, we produce ethane, propane, butane and naphtha. Naphtha does not contain, light naphtha does not contain these products, so light naphtha is liquid, so this will contain products that are C5, C6, C7, primarily, uh, you know, cycloalkanes or linear chain paraffins. Then ethane, propane can be steam cracking. Now, here you are using the steam, whether it is high pressure, low pressure, you are using steam to produce ethane and propane, which are the feedstock for petrochemical. Or you do a dehydrogenation, you form pyrotidine, which is again a monomer for rubber industries. Or from naphtha, you can also produce ethane, butane, or from naphtha, you can also produce hexane, butane, or pentane. Again, you can also produce butane, propane and butadiene. So, this is one way where you use crude oil and produce monomers for the petrochemical industry. Or sometimes what you do is ethene propene may be itself as a raw material, you do a stream trucking, you do uh, for, from ethane propane, you get separation, uh, sorry, just to recollect, the natural gas here is the feedstock. So, you separate the natural gas because it is primarily, you know, it is uh, primarily methane. So, you do different process, you can either take the condensate or uh, you convert it into dehydrogenation, you have butane, you convert to butadiene or you separation, you from this separation you get ethane and propane from natural gas, you do a stream cracking from ethane and propane. Again you do a stream cracking on the condensate, these are different process, so that is why this steam is very important, steam cracking, then from steam cracking also you can produce. So, from natural gas you can produce all the precursors for polymer industries, ethene, propene, all this butadiene, butene, butadiene, okay. This is another way. Well, first we saw from crude oil, well, now it is from natural gas. So, this was the previous slide, we just saw from crude oil, how we are producing the monomers for petrochemicals and from natural gas, how we are producing the monomers from natural gas. So, from naphtha also you can produce the aromatics, how you are putting them naphtha, these are different flow sheets we will study later on. We do a catalytic reforming, the reformate, then we do a solvent extraction, then we separate out benzene, toluene, xylene or we can take the toluene further, we do a hydroalkalization produce benzene or you take naphtha gas oil as the feedstock, do a steam cracking, you get pi gas, do a solvent extraction, get the again benzene, toluene, xylene or higher aromatics take out the toluene from this solvent extraction, do this hydroalkylation and produce benzene. So, these are different routes where you can obtain this aromatics in this case and the previously we saw the monomer C2, C3. From coal and biomass, both follow a similar route, you gasify them, then you do a partial oxidation, either you start with coal or you start with natural gas or you start with heavy liquid hydrocarbons, the routes are different. But finally, all of this natural, this feedstock, you apply a process and you convert it into syngas. Syngas is nothing but mixture of CO plus H2. So, once this is formed either through steam reforming, gasification or partial oxidation, once you form syngas, you clean the syngas and you can separate out hydrogen, you can form ammonia, you can form methanol or you can form carbon monoxide. So, these are the different products, high value products which you can form, which call the base chemical, you are form, getting from three different sources, from alternative sources, from fossil fuel, from natural gas and from heavy liquid hydrocarbon. 
So we come to the conclusion of this lecture and we have seen, we have seen the different sources of the base chemicals, raw materials, how they are converted to useful products, the value added products and also we discussed briefly about the biomass. So I will stop here, you go through this book and, uh, and I will request you to go through this two NPTEL courses which are already available which actually focuses on the biomass conversion and biorefinery concept and this I will also be using in the last module I will be discussing the biorefinery concept. There is another NPTEL course on renewable energy engineering, solar, wind and biomass energy. Please go through these uh, two NPTEL courses, you will, come to, you will come to know more about these processes in detail. Thank you. Thank you.